Hello, Malcolm Brady from Dublin City University. I'm going to talk to you today about um, the value chain, strategic uh, cost analysis, and the strategy canvas and benchmarking. And all of these are internal analysis techniques to do with the activities that the organization carries out. So we're very focused today on activities. And the first um, the one that's, that's shown in the slide here is the value chain, uh, well-known um, activity analysis uh, concept developed by Michael Porter originally in his book, Competitive Advantage. So that book centered very much on the value chain. <clears throat> and this is his basic model. Okay, you'll see different variations of this some tailored to specific industries and some with different, particularly different support activities given. But this is the original one from his book. So I, I'll show you that. As I say, you may see alternative versions. Um, but essentially his primary activities there are very much to do with the, um, uh, the systems model, okay? Input, process, output. That's the basis of it there. You can see inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics. And then he adds two that come after uh, those two, marketing and sales, which um, um, uh, support, well, it actually could be regarded almost as a support activity. And uh, it, it, it gets the product out and then services or after sales service. Um, <clears throat> so they're the main line. That's the main line of uh, the getting the product out to the customer. So inbound logistics is all the logistics to do with getting uh, components and so on into your firm. Uh, so all the dealing with suppliers, all of the organizing of um, supply to come into particular factories or plants or whatever it is, all of that sort of activity is inbound logistics. Outbound logistics then is the other side, anything that's taking your goods out of your premises and getting them to wholesalers or retailers or in direct to individual customers. Any activity under that heading would be outbound logistics. And then operations is to do with the transformation of the inputs into the outputs, the, the, uh, the transformation process, or in the systems world, uh, that would be process. And again, that's all the manufacturing operations and everything required to do with that, okay? Marketing and sales are self-evident and after sales services self-evident. So I won't say anything more on those. And then above the and the top half of the diagram there, he is what he calls support activities. So in other words, these are needed across all of these, uh, the main or primary activities. So procurement, because um, you need, for example, um, uh, uh, forklift trucks and so on for inbound logistics. Um, similarly, for outbound logistics, you might need a distribution network or distribution vans and so on, uh, all sorts of materials and, um, uh, needed, equipment needed for outbound, uh, postage, franking machines, all of that sort of stuff. Um, procurement obviously needed for operations itself, the equipment used to operate and all of the consumables used, all part of procurement. Similarly for marketing and sales and after sales, there's a certain amount of procurement activity. So procurement ac applies across the board. Similarly, human resource management applies across the board. People are needed in terms of input activity, operations, output, marketing, service, all of these require human, human uh, people to be um, re recruited, trained, and deployed. Technology, same thing, ditto uh, across all elements. And the firm infrastructure, this is more to do with, uh, this is more, more in general, the finance planning and so on are uh, not, necessarily for each individual uh, primary activity, but to ensure the firm as a whole um, does its job, okay? So there are his support activities and his primary activities. He also mentions two phrases, linkages, that it's important to look at the link, not so much, the, not just the individual boxes here, the individual sets of activities, the inbound logistics and so on. The linkage between inbound and operations or between outbound sorry, between operations and outbound, those linkages are critical. It's often that, that it's another to refer to as the white space between um, the white space and the organization chart can be difficult to manage. Each separate activity can, can, could be well managed within the activity, but the actual connections or linkages between the activities may not be that well managed. So it's important to look at those linkages. And the second thing you mentioned are, is this concept of profit pools. Um, Porter links his two generic strategies, cost leadership and differentiation with the value chain. And he says it's, you're a cost leader because you look at each, you know, you look at the relevant activities in your value chain and you make sure that those are, uh, the costs of those are, are kept down. Similarly with differentiation, um, it's somewhere within the value chain, somewhere with that's in that, within those set of boxes that that differentiation is created and offered to the customer. So 
uh, he, he talks about profit pools. Certain activities will be more profitable or certain sets of activities will be more profitable than others. And he talks about profit pools and he talks about identifying those to make sure that you look after your profit pools. <clears throat> Um, uh, lean and uh, JIT analysis and so on tends to look at um, value adding activities, which is a similar concept, to the notion of profit pools in Porter's value chain. Okay. Um, however, we looked at the value chain for a single firm. Obviously, the value chain, uh, each uh, firm, its suppliers will have their own value chain. Its um, buyers, be they uh, wholesalers, retailers, or customers, will also have their own value chain. So each of these um, uh, so semi-rectangular boxes, uh, rectangles with a kind of a triangle at the end of them. Um, each of those boxes is the value chain for the relevant firm. And this is a, a model of the supply chain where we're looking at the value chains for all of the, the, the entire industry put together. So we're extending the concept of value chain here to call this the supply chain for the industry. And uh, this is the soft drinks industry. So on the left there, we have the two uh, big manufacturers, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. So MC is the is represents the um, concentrate manufacturer for Coca-Cola. MP is Pepsi, the concentrate manufacturer. CP and CC are their costs, and WC and WP are their prices, the, the price that they sell to the bottlers, okay, the price of the concentrate. And then the BC, uh, sorry, the bottom one should be B, BP, um, <clears throat> the price for the, uh, the Coca-Cola bottlers and the Pepsi bottlers. And they in turn have their, they obviously take inputs um, from the manufacturers at the price of the inputs, WC, for the concentrate, and they sell the bottled product, uh, the final product uh, at a price or C to the retailer, who in turn puts on their margin and um, sells it to the consumer at the price for, as you, as you kind of know, for a can of Pepsi or a can of Coca-Cola, whatever it is, a dollar or a euro, um, and then the consumer buys those at that price, at those prices. So that's the supply chain for the industry. And you can see you can model it here as a set of value chains. And um, the final uh, line along the, across the top and across the bottom are advertising costs for uh, Coca-Cola along the top and Pepsi-Cola along the bottom. And uh, typically in this industry, it's the manufacturers of the concentrate who carry out the large scale advertising, not the bottlers or retailers. Um, bottlers and retailers do a certain amount of in-store promotion, but the big advertisements tend to be, uh, and the big advertising spend tends to be on the part of the uh, concentrate manufacturer. So hence we're seeing the manufacturers advertise directly to the consumer bypassing the bottlers and retailers. And that tends to be the way that model, that industry is structured. So you can see the value of this type of value chain model as a way of structuring the, um, structuring the industry. Apologies for that. <clears throat> Um, two other models then we can, sorry, yeah, two other con uh, concepts related to activity analysis are the strategic canvas. This is Kim and Moburn, uh, their model from their Blue Ocean strategy framework. Um, I think uh, this particular strategic canvas or value innovation model is, is useful um, as it, um, it looks again at the activities or the elements of their offering that are carried out. And you can see it on the bottom line here, um, the various offerings for the, uh, let's call it circus um, entertainment industry. And what they suggest is that you look at, you know, if you're creating a blue ocean, you look at uh, what goes on and you look at possibly creating some new elements to it, raising the standard of some elements reducing the standard of some elements that you, you're not particularly interested in or not particular, that are, you regard as not particularly valuable and even eliminating some elements, okay? So you can see the blue line there is Cirque du Soleil and that's one of their um, uh, exemplars of uh, Blue Ocean. And um, you can see what they've done is the, the bottom line there, um, they've increased the price, okay? So they figure their offering is better than their competitors. So they've increased the price reasonably, you know, substantially over the other, firms in the industry, they've reduced certain things, the star performers, they've eliminated the animals, they've eliminated the multiple arenas, the three ring circus they've eliminated. So they've eliminated those. Um, they've raised um, the venue, the unique venue, they've created a unique, more unique uh, type experience within the venue. So they've raised that one. Uh, they've reduced slightly the notion of fun and humor and thrill and challenge, you can see there. And they've 
added new elements. They've uh, put in place a theme across the whole performance, which doesn't tend to be the case in standard circuses, a more refined watching environment, so better seating, better um, um, watching arrangements, better audience arrangements, and introduced music and dance. Um, so they've added those elements and they've obviously been very successful. So Disobeys has been very successful. So that's um, an example of the strategy canvas in use, in use. You need to identify the elements that are a part of the offering in the industry. Not quite the same thing as activities, but obviously each of these things requires activities to, to carry out, um, but it's similar. And uh, as I say, create, raise, reduce or eliminate activities to create a, a special offering that gives you this competitive advantage under the heading of innovation. So it's an innovation-based advantage. And that's the way, that's what their model is based on. And then um, cost analysis then, obviously part of the value chain analysis is, you, you know, the activities you, 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 have in the, you have in your firm. So you can compare those, you can cost, you can work out the cost of each of those activities. Not particularly easy to do, and you can see this links with um, activity-based costing. So uh, it's easy in theory, but not easy in practice. But if you can do it, you can work out the cost of your activities and you can compare those costs with other, um, with, with other uh, with costs from other industries in, uh, using a benchmarking approach, which I have in the next slide. And you can look at those costs activity by activity and see how you're doing per activity. But you can also look uh, across the entire value chain and see your costs uh, across the value chain um, and compare those with other um, competitors or other similar organizations, or even different types of organizations that might carry out a similar type of activity. For example, a mortgage producer might compare its um, mortgage process with um, an insurance process, which is different industry, but the activity is not all that dissimilar. So that might be a possible benchmark for you. Um, so the activity analysis is trying to identify what parts of the value chain to focus on. That you might be able to identify your profit pools here where you've low cost but high value added uh, can, can be a profit pool or just where you have high costs but no particular, not terribly strong value added. It might be an area to concentrate on and try and reduce your costs. And also the cost analysis might bring you into your suppliers and indeed into your buyers activities or value chains. Because if your components are coming in at a high price um, you might want to work with your suppliers to try and get those prices down. So you might provide some kind of value chain or strategic cost analysis support to your suppliers or indeed to your buyers. And I mentioned benchmarking as a way of comparing price or comparing cost of activities. So you compare the activities with what you can find if you can find the best of breed or world-class activity in terms of time, cost and quality. The strategic cost analysis obviously focused on cost, but you can also look at cycle time or quality as well. And clearly different ways of doing that. Uh, you may find uh, some nice information in the literature. If so, you can compare directly with that. Field trips to other organizations or consultancies often have a database or an industry body might have a database of cost of activities. Um, and uh, if you're part of that industry body, body, you provide information, but you also get information back about competitors and you can use that as a basis for benchmarking your own activities. Okay, thank you very much.